Uh, I think uh, this is a very interesting time for me to be here because if you think you're alone in this, think again. We are all in this together in different parts of the world. In fact, I would say that in a place like the one where I live right now, California, we are looking at the Europeans because you're generally 10 years ahead of what's happening in California, believe it or not. But within the United States, California is probably the first adopter of new policies. So I'm pretty much located at the ground zero of what's happening in the United States. And while the United States federally has withdrawn from the Paris Climate Accord, Many states have not, and California is probably the most progressive of all states, and many communities have not. So um, I want to share with you uh, some of the experiences that we have made, and uh, I'm very hopeful. I'm not negative about this at all, like many are. Uh, I'm very positive and I'm hopeful because I see some good developments. One of the good developments that I see is that there is so much interest in this topic. I thank you for coming, and I think this is a great testament to the importance of this topic. So, um, I just had to, to put that slide in there in case you don't follow me, follow me. Uh, I think it's important that people network and discuss those issues. Um, now, a question to you. When you think of a place like California, what comes to mind when you think of California? What do you think of? Sunshine. Wine, sunshine, what else? Surfing. Surfing, what else? Most people think of Hollywood, they think of Silicon Valley, right? What I haven't heard from anyone here is agriculture. Guess what? California is the number one agricultural powerhouse in the United States. Twice as strong as the number two, which is Iowa. And we have very unique environmental issues in California. So on the one hand, we have a very unique situation where we have mountain ranges. This is the Sierra Nevada, this coastal mountain range. This year is the Great Central Valley, the most fertile soil in the United States. You can grow just about anything there because you have perfect soils and you have sunshine all year long, pretty much all year long. So in this area from Redding down to Bakersfield, we produce 400 specialty crops. 50% of all fruits and vegetables produced and consumed in the United States comes from there. 90% of all nuts, 20% of all dairy. So it is clearly a agricultural powerhouse rivaled by no one else. At the same time, we have intense environmental pressures on our ecosystems. I just told you we have these two mountain ranges. And that means any kind of air pollution and so forth that's generated in the valley or that's transported in from the outside, let's say from places like China or international ship traffic, all of these pollutants come through the Bay Area into the valley and they stay there for a prolonged period of time. So this year is actually the area in the United States with the worst air quality, the worst. And our agencies are confronted with similar challenges like yours are, which is we need to reduce emissions to air quality emissions to water, climate pollutants, and so forth. And I find that, um, particularly more recently, our agencies and our legislature have come to very workable solutions. 10, 20 years ago, the solution was, there's a pollution issue, let's come up with a regulation, uh, tell people what they need to do to reduce. If they don't do it, we find them. And then what happened? Guess what happened? Farmers left the state. But if you think that that reduced emissions, think again. They took the emissions with them and just went someplace else. In the case of climate pollutants, that's called leakage. The last thing our regulators want today is for farmers to leave the state. Because if they do, they take the greenhouse gases with them and emit them someplace else. And we are losing important economic firepower, and we don't want that. So. Why am I telling you the California story? Because I see similarities. I see similarities. Just like we produce way more agricultural product than we consume in the state, we are an export state, you are the same. You produce enough food to feed 30 million people, three zero, 30 million people. And so you are in a similar boat. You use different resources than we do because you have more marginal land <laughs> 
that's not really suitable for crop production as well as our land is. But you are confronted with similar challenges. So now I tell you what I think of when I think of Ireland. When I think of Ireland, I think back to my childhood in Germany, uh, buying butter from Ireland. Okay. Why? Because everybody there thinks that's the butter from the happiest cows in the world. Okay. It's green, it's lush, it's beautiful, it's, uh, it just has that, that uh, reputation all over the world. When people think of Irish farms, they think of happy cows. They think of you know, sound ecosystems and so forth. And uh, I now understand that that's not always the case here, but that's, the world, that's how the world views you. And that's why you are selling so much to the rest of the world, because they like that image, and they like what you do. So I think of a green island when I think of Ireland, and I think of grazing animals, cattle, sheep, and so on. And most people think that way when they think of Ireland. So they think of this, this green, lush island. They think of grazing animals. And you know what? Three days ago, I left California. I went from Sacramento, I flew across Los Angeles. And that looks like this. A city with 13 million people, okay? 13 million people. Every interstate there has 10 lanes. Some of them have 14 lanes one way. 13 million people. And it's all concrete and tar. And so I flew across this thing and thought about the carbon footprint it has. You know what the carbon footprint is of Los Angeles? It's 50 million metric tons, 50, five zero. The carbon footprint of Ireland, according to the current accounting system, is higher. It's 60 million. 50 million for Los Angeles, and they have a much higher population, 50 million for Ireland. And then I flew across Poland and I thought of this coal-fired power plant that has 40 million metric tons of emissions associated, greenhouse gas emissions associated with it. So 40 here, 50 here, 60 here. Does that make sense to you that a city like this with a population of 13 million people has less emissions than your island that's so lush and green and has a population of, what, fewer than four? Does that make sense to you? Something must be wrong here, right? Do you agree? Okay, so I think something is wrong, and I will share with you what I think is wrong, because in contrast to fossil fuel-related sources such as a power plant or largely a community like Los Angeles, you have quite some emissions that are not fossil fuel-related because that's your agricultural sector. And here methane plays an important role, and I will lead you through why that's important in this discussion. Give me a little uh, time just to run you through a 101 on climate change and greenhouse gases. First of all, uh, I can tell you, and I know many people in agriculture are skeptical of the overall concept of climate change. I totally believe that it happens and also that human activity is a contributor to it. The question is not, does human activity have a contribution to it? The question is, which activities that humans are involved in has what kind of contribution? The vast majority of climate scientists will tell you that the main human culprit for climate change is the use of fossil fuel, oil, coal, and gas. But then there are people, and I oftentimes call them distractors of agriculture, who say, no, 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 it's not that, it's what we eat that's the main impact on a changing climate. And I will talk about that. So this slide here just shows uh, a symbolic picture of um, the changing climate and its impacts here, the North Pole in yellow, the way it was some time ago, in white you see the, ice, the extent of the ice cap. Now, we see changes throughout the world in very different ecosystems, okay? Most climate scientists, the vast majority of them, will tell you it is happening and human activity has something to do with it. What you see on this slide here is a depiction of the sun radiating down solar beams to the surface of the Earth, and normally these solar beams would be reflected back into space, but because they are these greenhouse gases, they pretty much form a layer across our atmosphere, and every time the sun hits those molecules, they trap the heat, they absorb it, and because of that, solar radiation, the solar heat is retained in our atmosphere. The more of these greenhouse gases exist, the less solar radiation is going back into space, and the warmer it becomes. 
It's almost like a blanket. If you have a few greenhouse gases, you have a thin blanket. The more greenhouse gases you have, the thicker the blanket becomes. Okay? And with it, more heat is retained. Here are three of the greenhouse gases. The ones that are generally discussed are CO2 on the left, methane in the center, and the nitrous oxide on the right. And back in 1990, the IPCC was asked, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change was asked, and scientists uh, therein were asked, to please come up with some kind of comparison, relative comparison of those climate pollutants. And so they came up with a so-called global warming potential, GWP matrix, GWP. And they had 15 or 20 footnotes underneath their table. And instead of using the whole table, including the footnotes, only this portion here uh, was, was used for many, many years. It, it includes the so-called global warming potential, where people say methane is, let's say, 28, more, 28 times more potent than CO2. If a cow emits 100 pounds of methane, all you need to do is multiply that by 28, and then you know how much that is with respect to CO2 equivalents. So, long story short, what the policymakers used in the years thereafter was they used only this GWP and these, these factors here to compare different greenhouse gases in various sources. So, for example, what I showed you, the island of Ireland versus Los Angeles versus that power plant, if you compare them and you just use CO2 equivalents, then you come up with comparisons that sometimes do not make sense. In the case of Ireland, it does not make sense that you produce more greenhouse gases than LA. And if you visit LA, you will know what I mean. It doesn't make sense. So, what else is different across these gases other than the global warming potential? One of the most important things that's really different is the lifespan of these gases, with CO2 and nitrous oxide being long-lived climate pollutants, meaning once they're in the atmosphere, they stay there for pretty much forever. CO2 for up to a thousand years. Methane has a lifespan of approximately 10 years. Okay, I can have some more discussion on this, but for this purpose here, it suffices to say CO2 is approximately 1,000 years, methane approximately 10 years. So once we put CO2 in the atmosphere, it pretty much stays there forever. Every time you drive your car, every day you drive your car, you put new CO2 in the atmosphere. The only way CO2 goes is up, 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 up. It doesn't go down, it only goes up. Methane is different because in addition to being produced, methane is also destroyed. And I will show you what that process is like. So, what this slide here shows is a global methane budget depicted by the National Academy of Sciences in the United States. This is from a publication on anthropogenic uh, meth uh, anthropogenic methane. So, what this methane budget shows is various sources of methane, such as fossil fuel production and use, agriculture and waste, biomass burning, wetlands, and so on. And these different sources of methane amount to a total of 560, 560 teragrams globally. And most people who only report on, who report on methane really only report on the sources of that gas and leave out a very important second part of this discussion, which is that methane is not just produced, but also destroyed. And now I take you to this side of the slide, and it shows that globally, they're not just emissions, meaning sources, but also significant sinks. And they amount globally to 550 teragrams. So you have 560 produced and 550 destroyed and or put back into the soils. So this process by which methane is destroyed is referred to as hydroxyl oxidation. I know that's a mouthful. What it means is there are radicals in the atmosphere. When they see a methane molecule, they steal hydrogen away from the methane, and they convert the methane into CO2 and water. And that happens generally in around 10 years. Okay? That's how long it normally takes. So take home message, methane is not just produced. Methane is also destroyed and put away into soils. That is a very important distinction 
because as you can see in this red column, in this red square, the net methane globally is not 560, the net is 10. And that obviously is a huge difference. And I'm telling you that because methane is, in my opinion, the Achilles heel of agriculture, particularly the Achilles heel of animal agriculture. We have to have a good understanding of what happens to methane, what its fate is, and we need to properly account for it. Because if we don't do it, we come up with ideas of let's get rid of half our cows or let's use certain technologies in order to reduce it. I want to be very clear about this. Methane is an important climate pollutant. Methane has a high uh, heat forcing, okay? So uh, methane is a challenge to be dealt with, but one of the good things about it is there are mechanisms that take it out of the atmosphere. Now, the question is, what happens if we reduce it? If we reduce methane, we actually have very positive responses. I will show you in a minute what they are. But before I do this, I want to show you how livestock plays into this methane picture. What do plants need to grow? What do plants need to grow? They need water, they need CO2, and they need sunlight, and they need some fertilizer, right? So the carbon that plants need originates from here, atmospheric CO2. That carbon makes it into the plants, and then the plants assimilate that carbon and make it into carbohydrates. The number one carbohydrate that I see when I fly across island is cellulose. In fact, cellulose is the number one biomass in the world. In the world. Nothing is more abundant in the world than cellulose. Can we digest cellulose? No, we cannot digest cellulose. Can pigs digest cellulose or poultry? No, who can digest cellulose? Ruminant, Ruminant livestock can digest cellulose, and that's a beautiful thing, because that system is a solar-powered system that makes use of non-human edible feedstuff, and those ruminants convert that non-human edible feedstuff, that cellulose, into highly bioavailable uh, bio and digestible animal source food. And that is a beautiful thing, because you have so much of that cellulose here, because on much of your land you cannot grow anything else. That land that contains grass is referred to as marginal land. Marginal because you don't really have the soil quality or you know, there are other things missing to grow crops. Hence, you use it for grazing, okay? So, what is really important to note here is this carbon is now going into plants. It's converted into carbohydrates such as cellulose. Sooner or later, a bovine comes along and eats it. And a portion of that is then belched out. It's called enteric fermentation. It's belched out, enteric emissions, and uh, that methane, CH4, then stays in the atmosphere for approximately 10 years. And during that time that it's in the atmosphere, it undergoes oxidation processes. It's called hydroxyl oxidation, as I already said, in which methane is converted back into CO2. So now you might say, how is that a good thing? Didn't you just say methane is, has a lifespan of 10 and CO2 one of 1,000 years? Yes, I did say that. But what is special about this depiction here is the following. The carbon that is in here, this carbon that's now in the atmosphere, is not new carbon. It's recycled carbon. This carbon originated right here. It came from the atmosphere, it went into the plants, it was belched out or came from the manure of those cows. That carbon then went back into CO2, and this is a so-called biogenic carbon cycle. As long as you do not add additional livestock to your herds, if you were to keep your herds constant, then you would not add additional new carbon to the atmosphere. What I'm telling you is, you would not add additional methane to the atmosphere as long as your herds are stable. If you don't add additional methane to the atmosphere, you do not add additional warming to the atmosphere meaning constant livestock herds do not add additional warming. 
That additional warming you only get when you grow numbers of cows, of sheep, of whatever. However, if you reduce methane, for example, through feed additives or through ways that you deal with, me, with your manure or so, then something incredible happens. Namely, you can induce global cooling, a cooling effect. If you take methane out of the atmosphere, you have an instantaneous effect. And my colleagues from Oxford, Professor Allen and uh, Kane, call that global cooling that you are inducing by reducing methane. So you, if you were to do this kind of thing, would counteract, by reducing methane, counteract other sectors of society and be a solution provider to taking carbon emissions out of the atmosphere. Can that be done? Well, in California, as I already told you, we have a similar situation as you do here. Our politicians decided three years ago to have a law on methane. And they called that SB 1383, the short-lived climate pollutant law, the methane law, that mandated a methane reduction of 40%, 40 percent, four zero, 40 percent. And our farmers, just like you now, scratch their heads wondering, what in the world do we do about this? How can that be done? I will show you in a few minutes the results of what we have done so far, how far we have come. And I can tell you one thing that makes me hopeful, that in our state, our agencies decided we will not use the cane approach of rules, regulations, and fines. But we will partner with the farmers, and we will incentivize techniques and technologies, and we will financially partner with our farming community to achieve reductions. And that, to me, was revolutionary because I've never seen that before. But guess what? That actually worked. That actually worked. The fines never worked. The incentivizing, that was the trick. So um, this is just the same depiction of what I just showed you here. On the fossil fuel side, you have carbon that was locked in the ground for a long time, for millions of years. By extracting it from the ground, we're unlocking it, we are putting it into the atmosphere, and there it accumulates. By the way, I'm, I'm sorry I have to go back to this one here. So I told you about the biogenic carbon cycle, and that's in contrast to the fossil fuel-related emissions, greenhouse gases, where fossil fuels, meaning oil, coal, and gas, were stored in the ground for a very long time. Over the last 50, 60, 70 years, we have taken about half of that out of the ground. And what have we done with it? We've burned it. So where's that carbon now? It's in the atmosphere, and every time the sun hits it, these things heat up. That's why the climate science community says that the number one culprit of climate pollutants are because of the use of fossil fuels. So what happens here is that carbon comes from down there, it's burned, and it goes right there into the atmosphere. And there most of it stays and accumulates. So on the cow side, you have a biogenic carbon cycle. And as long as you don't add new cows, you're not adding new carbon, you're not adding new warming. On the fossil fuel side, you have a one-way street. And every time we burn gasoline, oil, coal, we add new additional carbon to the atmosphere. That's a major difference. I hope everybody understands that. A major difference. So that is why you shouldn't look at three pictures of Ireland, of Los Angeles, and of a coal-fired power plant, and just look at the CO2 equivalent numbers. Because in two cases, this is what happens. The one-way street scenario. Whereas in Ireland, you have a lot of this happening. A cyclical movement of carbon through a system. And that's depicted also here, where you see CO2 in the atmosphere, plants gobble up the CO2, they assimilate, sequester it, it then goes into the soil, is locked away. You see the cow here belching out methane, that methane becoming CO2 again. So this is the biogenic carbon cycle right here. It's a little bit more complex as the one I just showed you before. But that's what we're talking about. If you're interested in the topic, and I know you should, and you most likely are, these are two uh, articles that are written for a non-technical audience, but there are some that are written in a very technical way and published in journals such as Science and Nature. These two articles I recommend because they explain why we should and why we must treat 
methane, that short-lived climate pollutant, differently compared to the fossil fuel-related ones that are long-lived. Because if we don't, we achieve wrong, unintended public policy uh, consequences. So I already told you that California decided to not go the cane approach, but the carrot approach, to incentivize reduction of methane and work with farmers to reduce emissions. The state of California, over the last two years, invested half a billion dollars, that's with a B, half a billion dollars, and the dairy industry matched that funding. So that's a lot of money there. What did they do? Now our dairies look different compared to yours. Uh, our dairies are large in size. The average dairy size is a 1,500 cows. We have many dairies that have 3,000 cows, some that have 10,000 cows. If you have fewer than 500 cows in California, you're not viable. You cannot make a living. You cannot feed a family. I mean, that's how different things are there. The manure is generally flushed into a lagoon, so now you have the manure in a lagoon, okay? So now you can trap that gas that would normally come from the lagoon, and you can do things with it. And that's the use of anaerobic digesters, which are now incentivized by the California, um, by California agencies. Why? Because we take that biogas from the digesters, and we don't burn it and make power, that's what people did in the past, but now that gas is trapped, it's converted into what's called renewable natural gas, and then that renewable natural gas is used to run vehicle fleets. So instead of driving their semi-trucks on diesel, they are now running them on renewable natural gas. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is a new gold rush in California. And I am not exaggerating. There's so much money to be made with that because the farmers get very large credits for converting what would normally go up into the sky and convert that into renewable natural gas and sell it to the markets. Huge incentives. Farmers all over the United States now want to have these California credits. So they have figured out a market mechanism in California to incentivize the reduction of methane. Now that doesn't, the same thing does not work here, but there, there might be uh, similar avenues uh, to, to look at here. So, how far have we come in California? I told you we have a 40% reduction goal to be achieved by 2030, below 2013 levels. We are here today. We have reached over half of that 40% reduction goal in the last two years. And that makes me hopeful. And it should make you hopeful because if your industry manages to partner with government agencies and everybody understands the importance, the strategic importance of your sector for, the, for this country, then I think great advances can be reached. And when I say strategic importance for this country, what is more important to a country than health and food, nothing, nothing. And your food system, your agricultural system is largely based on the use of forages, right? If I'm wrong, please tell me, okay? But that's the impression I'm under, that you have uh, an agricultural system that is largely based on use of marginal resources. That's what you're known for all over the world and you're known for making the best use of that marginal resource, that grassland. By the way, we've done research in California on the importance of grasslands with respect to carbon sequestration, and we found that grasslands can capture as much carbon as forests can. And to me that is, to me that is, to me that's very interesting. This, this research has been published, this research has been published, it's uh, open for the world to read, uh, and I find this is really, uh, really important. If I have one recommendation to, uh, to this group, it is please look into the sequestration potential that you are currently unfolding already and that might have not been quantified in the way it should. In the United States, for example, our agriculture and forestry sector combined emits, emits 550 
million metric tons, 550. But they sequester 720. They emit 550, they sequester, take out of the air 720. Meaning agriculture and forestry in the United States today is a net sink of greenhouse gases. If you read the most recent IPP, IPCC report that came out uh, in 2019, you will find that the IPCC said similar things about global agriculture and forestry, land use, land use change sectors, which have very significant sequestration potential. I think this is a very important topic for this country because of the way that you run your fields, where you don't plow everything under, like in many other countries, but you leave it undisturbed and you have livestock on it, the livestock defecates, urinates and so on, but you are not digging up all that soil, releasing all the carbon. I think that you have a unique uh, opportunity along those lines. So in the United States, and of course I know we are not in the United States here, I just want to show you what our EPA says our different sectors of societies emit. In the United States, transportation emits about 30% of all greenhouse gases, as does power production and use. Industries such as the cement industry, 22%. These three fossil fuel consuming industries combined emit about 80%, 80. And our agricultural sector emits 9%, of which animal agriculture is 3.9%. That's the numbers for the United States, 3.9% for animal agriculture. In California, it's about 5% for animal agriculture, 50% for transportation in California. I will now talk to you uh, briefly about the so-called 2050 challenge, which is a global challenge of major proportions, and I think it plays into what we are talking here about as well. What is the 2050 challenge? It's depicted on this slide. On the x-axis, you see the year 1750 to 2050, hence the name 2050 challenge. And what it shows is human population increase in billions over the years. I just turned 50, and when I was a little boy, we were right here, three billion people in the world. Today we are here at 7.6, and by the time I'm an old man, we'll be here at 9.5 billion people in the world. And what that means is that the human population on our planet throughout our lifetimes will have tripled, will have tripled, but the natural resources to feed these people will not have tripled. We will not have three times more land and water, fertilizer, and so on by the time we are old compared to the time we were young. And that means what? That means we have to become a whole lot more efficient in how we produce food. And we have to use all resources known to man to satisfy the nutritional needs. What you see on this slide are also two colors. You see an orange, and that's human population development in the developed world, so the Americas and Europe. And then this other one shows emerging countries and developing countries. And you can see human population is going through the roof there. This slide here is one of my favorite slides. It shows the world from space and this circle over South Southeast Asia containing more people in it than the rest of the world combined. More people live inside this circle than outside this circle. Amazing, right? But it's not the only region in the world. It's the one that depicted here, which is growing 41% human population, but Africa will grow 50%. That's where the 2050 challenge will take place, in Africa and in South Southeast Asia. Not so much in the Americas and definitely not in Europe. So if we produce in excess to our own needs, and you do that in Ireland and we do that in California, then that food we are producing goes to places where it's needed. We need to produce food where we can, where it's most ideal, and have that food move around the world. That's just the way this works. It's the way it works where I live, it's the way where you live, that's the way it works. Because if we don't do that, people over here will do what? People from over here and people from over there, they will pack up and they'll leave where they are. And if you don't believe me, then just look at what happened to my native country, Germany, two years ago, where within one year, a million refugees streamed into that country many of them from food insecure regions of the world. It is going to happen if we don't work on it, that people will leave their home countries because they're food insecure. 
This year is human population increased in parts of Asia. As you can see there, uh, human population is going up quite a bit. But look at Africa. Every red country here has a human population increase of over 100%, meaning they double their human population every decade. Every decade. And these are also, by the way, the countries with the least efficiency in food production. They have the, great, the hardest time producing enough food for the status quo, what they have currently. And then they are growing human population at the same time. This year is an important slide. It shows the global cropland. That's all, we land, that's all the land we have in the world. And whether we have 3, 7, 9, or 12 billion people, that's how limited we are. I want to show you a quick depiction, one that I think is very powerful. It applies to most parts of the world. Imagine this sheet of paper here being the entire surface of the Earth. That's everything. If I now fold this paper, and I fold it twice, it will be approximately the size of a postcard. What you see now is the area in the world, that's all the land. The rest is water and ice. This is all the land, the rest is water and ice. This year, ladies and gentlemen, is my business card. The equivalent amount of land of my business card is all agricultural land. So this is all land, this is all agricultural land. I will now take my business card and I'll fold it into one piece that's one-third and one piece that's two-thirds, and then I'll rip it apart. So again, this is all agricultural land. The larger of the two pieces is all marginal agricultural land, meaning this land here is not suitable to grow crops because it's either not fertile soil or there's not enough water. Two-thirds of all agricultural land in the world is marginal, cannot be used to grow crops. What do we do on this land? We graze ruminant animals. That's what we do on two-thirds of all agricultural land today. Those people advocating for us getting rid of ruminant livestock would effectively argue to not making use of two-thirds of all agricultural land. I think that would be totally unethical. The remainder one-third of my business card is all arable land in the world. That's the land where you can grow crops to feed people and or animals. In my view, getting rid of this land use here makes no sense. Wherever we have land available that's suitable to grow food, feed, meaning grass, for ruminant animals, in my opinion, we should make use of that. However, we should reduce the negative impacts that exist and bring the numbers down as much as we can. But we should grow that food at the places where it grows the best. And that's places like California. And it is places like Ireland. So I will now, uh, just really briefly here, when people think of the food supply chain and what has the most negative environmental consequences, they think of transportation of food and so on, but that's not really it. By far the most negative thing about the food system in my country and in yours, it is depicted on this slide. This slide here shows a US family in front of all the food waste associated with that family. 40% of all food produced in the United States goes to waste. 40% of all food in the European Union goes to waste. 40% of most food across the world goes to waste. That is a huge environmental problem because think about all the inputs that went into making that food for nothing. I think we should really work on that issue and make that a high priority because the resources that went into it and the environmental externalities associated with it are immense. I think everybody here would agree that it's crazy to have wastages like that. These are either consumer losses, or these are uh, consumer waste losses, or these are agricultural or uh, production losses. In our countries, in the developed world, it's the food losses, food waste mainly occurs at the consumer level, and not so much on the farm, not so much post-harvest processing on, <laughs> and so on. So, this slide here shows the correlation between milk productivity, dairy productivity per cow per year on the x-axis, and the carbon footprint on the y-axis. And what this slide shows is for every dot here, every dot is one country in the world. What you see is that there are many countries in the world 
where cows have a decimal productivity. There the cows produce a thousand kilos or less of milk per cow per year. A thousand kilos or less per cow per year. In the United States, it's currently about 11 tons, 23,000 pounds. We produce more with one cow in the United States as 20 cows do in India, or five cows do in, in, in places like Mexico. So what I'm telling you is we should produce food in those places of the world that have the relatively lowest environmental footprints. Your production of beef and dairy is leading in the European Union. I mean, you have about the lowest environmental footprint per unit of weight, kilogram of meat or liter of milk in the, United, in the, in the European Union. This year is a comparison of different regions in and throughout the world for milk and the carbon footprint on the y-axis. And you can see North America and Europe uh, being in the low end and then uh, those areas that are generally food insecure throughout the world uh, in Africa and Asia are very high with respect to carbon footprint of milk production. So, really quickly here, in the United States we used to have 25 million dairy cows, today we have nine. But with this much smaller herd today, we produce 60% more milk. We have shrunk our carbon footprint of a glass of milk by two-thirds over the last 70 years. And I know you've done the same thing. You are producing way more with much less today than you did in the past. We've done the same thing for pork. We have tripled pork production with the same inputs. We have decreased our beef herd in red, but drastically increased beef production. So I'll not go into China here because we, I'm out of time. But uh, we have done something that is remarkable. In the United States and in Ireland and many other European countries, we have kept inputs in farming pretty much constant while we have tripled outputs. And that has a very significant impact on our environmental uh, uh, footprint. That's my last slide. Can we eat our way out of climate change? I know we have protesters out there saying, you know, let's stop consuming milk, other dairy, and stop eating meat, and so on. That will make a big difference. If, assuming you're an omnivore, if you were to decide to go vegan for one year, for one year, then that would reduce, you, it would reduce your carbon footprint by 0.8 tons. By 0.8 tons. If you were to do what I'm doing tomorrow, which is fly across the Atlantic, then that one flight equates to 1.6 tons of CO2 equivalents. The one, the one Frank Mittlerner flying across the Atlantic back and forth produces 1.6 tons of CO2 equivalent gases, okay? And that's twice as much as somebody would save if he or she were to become vegan. Just to give people an idea as to uh, what that impact would be. If the entire United States were to go one day less meat and milk and so on, we would reduce our carbon footprint by 0.3%. If the entire U.S. were to go vegan, and that's similar here, if the entire nation were to go vegan, you would produce the carbon footprint of your nation by around 2.6 to 3%. But the authors of these studies warn that if you were to go that route, you could not satisfy your population with essential macro and micronutrients. And who wants to risk that? So with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. I'll just show you that one slide here really briefly. What you see here is a fence line. On the one side of the fence, you see a California dairy. On the other side, you see recent urban encroachment. These people moved there, and why did they move there? Because land was cheap, <laughs> relatively cheap. What was the first thing they did after they moved there? I hear complain. No, complaining is for losers. In California, you sue each other, OK? <laughs> so these people sued this guy to make him go out of business. So that's my contact information. Thank you very much for your attention.